Welcome everyone. Uh, today's session, we're going to talk about um, how Patch My PC loves PS App Deploy Toolkit or PS ADT. Hopefully, you guys have all heard of PS ADT. Just a quick show of hands: who has used it before? That's pretty good. Who has used Patch My PC or knows who Patch My PC are? Okay, that's almost exactly the same. Um, so today, uh, I we all work for Patch My PC, um, but we're not really talking about uh, patch today. We're going to be really focusing on PS App Deploy Toolkit and all the fun new features you're going to roll out. Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, the title here is Why Does Application Packaging and Deployment Suck So Much? Uh, and How Can We Improve It? I did come up with that title. I should know. Um, so we're really just going to talk a little bit about the challenges we're currently facing in, the, in this industry. Um, we've probably all got trauma stories of terrible, terrible applications that we've been told to package and deploy. We're going to talk a little bit about that and then Really focus on how uh, PS ADT can help with that. Click. Okay, so I've already done the agenda. We're going to do some introductions, um, application packaging, a little bit about who we are, Patch My PC, and then we're going to dive right into PS App Deploy Toolkit, and then we've got a bunch of demos because demos are fun. They're better than slides. All right, introductions. So my name is Ben Rita. Uh, some of you might know me as Powers Hell. Um, I'm a software engineer at Patch My PC. I do have to read this because sometimes I'm not sure what I do. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP of, of, I think, enterprise mobility. I think it's changing. I think I'm now in security, which is cool. We all love security, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is my beautiful cat, Preston. Excellent. Okay. And, uh, I'm Dan Cunningham. Uh, I'm one of the founders of PSADT, and uh, now I work for Patch My PC since uh, uh, they've taken stewardship. Yes. Right. And my name is uh, David James. I'm VP Engineering at Patch My PC. I used to, for a long time, run the Configuration Manager product team at Microsoft. Uh, if you've heard of me, that uh, yeah, I go by DJammer on Twitter. Um, X. And what's that? X. X. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that vibrant uh, ecosystem that it is. Um, and and uh, I'll just call out something up front because Dan will probably get to it later. But, you know, <clears throat> one of the things uh, Patch My PC is a big uh, believer and uh, supporter of PSADT. And, and the question we get more than anything is like, you know, PSADT was free and open source. Are you guys going to start charging for it? Like, no matter how many times we say no, uh, the question comes up all the time. Dan, you're probably going to talk about it a little bit. And it's funny because when I, uh, I used to go to conferences a lot for Microsoft and talk about Configuration Manager, and I always get the question, is Config Man dead? And one day at a conference, I'm like, someone should just go get the domain name, is configmandead.com, and just put no there. So someone did. And now it's actually, you can live blog new announcements about Config Man there. So we get this question about PSADT so much, we got the domain name, is psadtfree.com? And you can go there with all of our latest updates on our intent to keep it uh, free and open source. And, you know, if you're uh, looking for something to contribute to, it's a great place to kind of practice your PowerShell or, or, or do very impressive stuff. We have some really good contributors. Um, and that's why Patch My PC is here. And, and really, we needed an excuse to keep sending Ben around the world to speak at PowerShell conferences because Patch My PC, we don't really have anything to do. We, we come here and we're like, well, we make patching really easy. We have like a WinForms app that just you push it and it works. But that doesn't resonate with this community. They like hard things. They like to type a lot. And they, so we, we went and uh, got involved with PSADT so Ben could have an excuse to go around the world and go to PowerShell conferences. So Very good introduction. It's all true. All right, so application packaging, a brief history of pain. Who here has to package applications as their day job? <laughs> Who here's ever had to do it? All right, that's almost everyone. So first of all, I feel your pain. We've all done it, it's awful. It never gets better and it probably never will. Um, this is obviously one of the things we're going to talk about, um, you know, that PS ADT makes it just that little bit better, but I don't think application packaging will ever be fun. It just won't. Probably not. Right? Probably not. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is just like why this is painful because surely there's a standard, right? All vendors just use this one thing. They package their applications. You want it to be silent. You just say be silent and it just works. Why is that not the case? So we're going to start off with, Packaging technologies. Again, 
it should just be one, right? And Microsoft should have written it. It started off with a small company called Nullsoft, uh, who created Winamp, uh, everyone's favorite music player. Uh, they came up with this uh, way to de deploy their software called NSIS, which is Nullsoft Scriptable Installation S System. Yes. Yes. Uh, which was really cool, uh, but it was their own little proprietary thing, and it still exists in the world. So that's why we need to talk about it. Um, it is kind of cool, and it's like a text file that just like prompts what's going to happen. It's all very easy to read, but it's you know not official. So then we come along, Install Shield comes around and starts building their own fun things. Which was hell. Yes, it was it was hell. We then move on to officially supported first party installation packaging solutions, which is MSI or Microsoft Installer. Uh, Windows, Installer. Windows Installer, yeah, but it's MSI. Excellent. Um, cool. Everyone knows what MSIs are. That's kind of still the preferred standard. Um, if you follow the rules, you can make a standardized application that anyone can work with. It's basically just a glorified database of things. Uh, so you can interrogate that, figure out what the switches are. It's cool, but like, you know, it's been around for a really long time and I know there are other technologies. Then, then, <laughs> then came Install Shield's mashup with MSI, which was just a hot mess. And uh, I'm, anyone who's had any experience with Install Shield, yeah, it's, it was a custom action nightmare. Uh, yeah, not fun. Exactly. Uh, Install Shield, uh, I've still got scars from thinking about how you have to like break out the, the scripted path to get the, oh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's terrible. We then move on to WireScript. I know of Wires whenever I see the little logo on the login or on the, on the installs, I just. So I will tell you straight off. Uh, so WireScript was actually the basis for uh, where uh, PSAVT came from. Uh, we use WireScript all the time. And it was really nice and easy that had a graphical interface for uh, just dropping files around and uh, there was dialogue boxes and things like that. And it made life a hell of a lot easier. Well, it was basically that the company was sold and bought like by about five different five different times. And uh, ultimately, we couldn't rely on it as a supported kind of platform to, to move forward. So DJM just said it's all his fault. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, one of the things that I want to point out here is that a lot of this technology is still in the era that the GUI is supreme. So you can do a lot of automation with MSI uh, installers now, um, but you know a lot of the install shield and like wise stuff was really focused on having like a nice user interface that you know you you could download a thing off the internet, you know, click along, and we all know that clicking can't be automated. It can, but anyway, so. We're starting to move into sort of the modern era, I think. I can't remember what comes up next. Yep, AppV. So AppV was created with this idea that why should we install products into the sort of the base of our system? It's really hard to like clean them up, uh, look after those things. So let's start looking at the concept of containerization, which we all know containerization is kind of the future now. Um, this was the first attempt at that. Um, this was created by Microsoft. Wasn't a lot of adoption. It got kind of difficult to work with. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember that many companies that, that actually went. Yeah, on it. when it was announced, all the vendors were just like, "Yeah, we're just going to stick with what we've got." And this is the one thing that we really want to sort of push home here is that we have to deal with all of these different things. The vendor just picks one, but we have to deal with every single vendor. So this is where like we need to know all these things because they all work differently. After out V, click once. Has anyone worked with click once before? Yep, it was a way to move files from the internet onto your computer. It would... <laughs> Never used it. Yeah. yeah, we had a no. fun internal application at a previous in uh, previous life that was terrible. We forced them over to MSI. Um, we then move into App X, which is the more modern thing. This is like think of Windows Store, um, heavily built around the concepts of App V, um, but. Sandboxed and that meant that you couldn't break out and do anything outside of the current user. Correct, account. which in theory, if you're building small apps that are user focused, cool. If you've got a complex thing, think ODBC connections, complicated database things, it, it just got really difficult. If you needed to interact with the system, it was hard. So and there was no real deployment mechanism for it. Uh, there really wasn't. Yeah. yeah, so rough. I think we've got some more. Click to run. Who's deployed uh, Office 365 before? Yeah. The people that had their hands down 
Good for you. Um, <laughs> Click Drum was developed specifically for Office 365, which has always been a, a real pain to package and deploy. This was supposed to simplify it. It kind of does, um, but also with the advent of, of Intune and like this more sort of modern delivery mechanisms, it's become less of a problem. But you know, we have to talk about that one. I think there's another one. Oh, MSIX. Another iteration of this like containerized uh, deployment methodology. Um, this was supposed to come in and save the day and be the standard. But again, vendors have already picked what they want to use. They don't want to have to retool to change how their product that already installs fine just because someone says this is the new standard. So this is where we get into that confusing space. So. Once we now know all of the terrible uh, implementations and hopefully the vendors are following the rules and doing it correctly, we've got this package that we can deploy. How do we deploy it? Well, that's where the next bit of pain comes in. So we've got deployment and delivery tooling. We'll quickly go through these. I think everyone knows of the two big ones, Configuration Manager, which has gone through how many different names? SACM. MemCM. MemCM, yeah, exactly. There was one before. Config manager. Um, these are just the industry, industry standards. Intune is coming along and being all cloud native and shiny, but you know, there's, there's still a lot of people that are using both of these things. So you need to know how to use these products before you can even use them to deploy uh, your packages that you've just spent hours working on. I think we've got a couple of other ones. Tanium deploy, PDQ. There's a lot of third party uh, implementations that help you with, with managing environments. We bring them up here. Um, we're not picking on them. We're simply saying there's a lot of different things uh, that exist to help with this process, but you still kind of need to be skilled and knowledgeable about them. And then the real one, which is just a drawer full of USB keys with your software. Yeah, I've literally gone into customer environments and they've had a, a, a lanyard with a key ring full of USBs and they go, this is my deployment method. It still exists. Yeah. And also uh, VB scripts on them written by the intern, which, you know, <laughs> I've done it. Okay. And then finally, the third part of this, and I've kind of touched on this, is that the vendors themselves get these standards that were written by other vendors, and then they get to interpret them however they want. So we've got iTunes. Has anyone tried to deploy iTunes? One person. Okay. Bonjour. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'm not even going to say the names. I'm not even going to say the names. That was a little sassy one. That was a bit of fun. Um, that was because of Chrome, essentially. Uh, Chrome came up with their own uh, deployment methodology and Teams was built on that framework and it's a nightmare. Yep. Okay, so we know that this is, this is the thing that makes our jobs hard. The reality is, once you know all of these things, an application generally takes between three to five hours to package every single time there's an update, and that's if it's good. That includes testing, packaging, deploying out to your environments, and then finally deploying to prod. So just understand you've got you know, three to five hours of updates, there's thousands and thousands of applications, and they're constantly being updated because now the internet makes things really fast to just ship changes, um, and this is where we come into our problem. That whole process never stops. Wasn't that fun? Okay. So what we really need in this environment is some kind of way to standardize. I don't think we'll probably ever really get to that, but if we can start building out a standardization framework, then that's where we can sort of get into that world of less headaches. Okay. Going to go through these really quickly because I know we're on time. I know you're chewing up more time on me. It's perfect. No, it's fine. Okay. So again, who is Patreon PC? It says it here, we help you save time, money, and improve IT security by automating third-party patch management in Microsoft Config Manager and Intune. The short of that is we have a catalog of around, Andrew, 1,400 applications, 1,500 applications, I can't keep up, that we know how these products install and that we know how to keep them up to date so that you can opt in to simply select the applications that you want to be looked after in your environment configure and customize them, and then move them into Config Manager and Intune to be automatically deployed on a schedule so that you never have to think about it again, in theory. There's always going to be problems, but you know, we've, we're pretty confident that our catalog is really, really good, and our automation technologies are pretty great as well. Okay, 
That's who we are. Now I get to hand it over to you. Yeah, you hand it over to me. Excellent. All right. Um, so uh, let's get intimately acquainted with PSADT in 30 minutes or less. And actually, I've got 30 minutes. Good job. Excellent. Uh, okay. So um, what is PowerShell or what is the PowerShell App Deployment Toolkit? It is a PowerShell framework for improving the experience of deploying software to Windows endpoints at scale. Uh, is basically the best way that we can sum it up. Um, and it does that through an opinionated workflow for app install, uninstall, and repair. Um, and it's typical, uh, typically used to encapsulate an, an existing pre-existing uh, pre vendor install, um, adding new steps to the install, uh, providing it enhanced capabilities, uh, something like, um, sorry, adding new steps to the install, like uh, performing tasks before an install or after install, uh, performing, uh, providing enhanced capabilities like uh, user interaction or automatic logging, and basically just standardizing your application deployments uh, for any given organization. And fixing vendors' terrible application installs. Yes. Uh, and it's basically this, this workflow is essentially backed by a collection of PowerShell functions to simplify common deployment. So uh, we have a whole range of functions for uh, doing things like copying files, editing registry keys, uh, registering OEBC connections, the, the, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the sort of features and functions we have is essentially validating uh, prerequisites uh, for minimum software versions. Um, ensuring we can close down applications and prevent them reopen, reopening um, during the install, uh, re reopening during the deployment. Um, checking if a user with the user if now is a good time to uh, start the install and allow them to defer it if need be. Uh, maybe checking to see if PowerPoint is open or uh, as we're working on adding as Teams and maybe other uh, other meeting software uh, to make sure that they're not running and uh, we're not going to shut them down. Uh, uninstalling any existing applications or performing any sort of cleanup operations that might be needed before an install. Uh, capturing important settings that might be required for an upgrade. Uh, so let's say if you want to capture uh, office office settings or something like that, or uh, we'll say templates or things like that. Yeah. Uh, running an install silently and capturing log files uh, in the event of an issue. So uh, simplifying de deployment troubleshooting. Uh, running post-install configuration tasks uh, that might be required for customizing an application for your environment. And maybe prompting the user to uh, shut down the machine or restart the machine uh, with some sort of countdown uh, timer at the end. Uh, so why would do or what, what benefits does it essentially give? Well, it reduces the learning curve uh, for learning PowerShell in the first instance. Um, and we do this by having a standardized uh, configura configurable template uh, for uh, doing deployments. Um, and we add a dozen easy PowerShell, or PowerShell functions as well. Uh, things like I said, copy files, write registry, show progress message. Um, and we provide very kind of clear and concise documentation uh, for every function, as well as kind of general guidance on, on, the, on its usage. It's um, robust and it's very, very well battle tested. Uh, so it's been built for stability. When we built this, uh, I was working at a large financial in Ireland of, I thought large, uh, <laughs> over around 2000 machines. Uh, then I, we started, uh, I moved to a company with uh, sorry, same company, different country, uh, for 10,000 machines. But by then, it was already being used on uh, customers of 50,000 endpoints. Nowadays, I know of a customer that's 800,000 endpoints, and I know I'm pretty sure there's one that's 1.3 million endpoints, and they use it to drive all their deployments. Uh, so uh, it's, it's across every single sector, uh, banking, fintech, uh, financial services, federal government, um, military and defense, uh, hospitals, healthcare, uh, education, uh, telecommunication, transportation, the whole nine yards. Uh, everyone is using it. And uh, it's used to drive uh, millions of deployments every single day. So it's, uh, it's grown way beyond the scale when we originally, that we originally thought it would have. Um, I just wanted to make my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's how it always starts. Yeah. Uh, so um, because of this, it's been very widely adopted by a lot of different deployment teams. And um, that allows everyone to adhere to kind of, well, our decided best practices. <laughs> so um, it was an opinionated uh, workflow, but it has it is built on kind of best practices in the industry and uh, what we thought initially at the time. But obviously, other people have fed into that over time. Um, but um, being being a kind of a standard workflow that everyone is using means that uh, others can pick up your deployment script and just know what's in there, and they'll just like be able to figure it out within a, a couple of minutes. It makes for much better collaboration. 
um, and it leads to supportability as well. Uh, if you run into a problem, you can ask a colleague, um, you can uh, ask a, a whole variety of different vendors, uh, you know, um, uh, as well as that, there's a lot of companies that now require it as part of their job spec. So uh, I can think of the one defense contractor that they won't hire someone unless they have three years uh, PSADT experience. Uh, another is a consultancy, uh, big, one of the big kind of uh, hardware uh, vendors. Uh, they, they also do consultancy for deployments and they require at least five years uh, experience, which given that it's been around, actually it's been around 13 years. Yeah, so uh, it's crazy. five years actually will be very feasible. Uh, it simplifies your deployment troubleshooting. So all the built-in functions have extensive logging. Um, if you run an MSI, we'll automatically capture that. Um, uh, we'll capture all the logs for that. Uh, hang on, sorry, I lost myself. Uh, it, we log it to the CM trace format and um, it just makes troubleshooting easier in general. We integrate with SCCM and Intune. We'll integrate uh, with, uh, I think it's Workspace ONE. We have explicit stuff in there for, but I mean, we play nicely with every uh, other product like uh, Big Fix, Avanti, uh, Tanium Deploy, PDQ. We'll just work with anything. Uh, the user interface is very customizable and uh, brand uh, customizable for your for your individual company. So uh, you can replace the logo, you can replace the banner, uh, you can change all the text strings, and you can do that in every language. So uh, yeah, it's, if you've got your own corporate verbiage for applications like or software or whatever you want to call it, you can you can update all that. And most importantly, it's got a very, very extensive community support. So we have Discord channel, we have Discourse forums, we have Reddit. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who've uh, contributed tons of uh, deployments, uh, deployment scripts, as well as like their own functions and uh, customizations uh, to help everyone out, essentially. So, um, Demos seem kind of pointless since most people in here have used this, but I guess we'll step into a couple of demos. Let's do it. So, demo time. Demo time, yes. All right. So where am I starting here? Uh, uh, so first off, um, if anyone or if no one has seen, we've updated our website recently. Uh, it used to be old and horrible. Now it's new and actually shiny. Uh, so we have uh, lots of info there on, the, on its features and capabilities. Most importantly, we have our documentation right up front, uh, all the information on how to download and how to get a copy of it, um, how to run through your first deployment. We have info on how zero config deployment works, uh, how to add UI elements and um, uh, customize your deployments. There's some examples on how to actually work with, uh, I think this was SCCM. We're due to get an Intune uh, example up there uh, in short order. As well as that, we have all the reference for uh, the uh, exit codes, uh, the variables, and all of the functions that are used in the toolkit as well. So um, if you, we used to issue a PDF with, with the toolkit. That's the old, old. This is the new, new. So go to the website and get all, get all the, the nice. I think that's called the new hotness. The new hotness. Thank you. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can, you can like click around here and you'll, you'll immediately get all of the functions that we have, all the new things that we, or all of the, um, uh, this, this will be updated like as we issue every new release. We'll automatically update the website with new functions. So, <clears throat> you know, you've got like, I think one of the new ones that we added the other day was copy files of user profiles. Uh, this is uh, added in 3.10, uh, which is a new release that was issued about two weeks ago. Um, so yeah, we've got examples in there, how you use all the parameters, and it's in the nice familiar PowerShell format that people are used to. So definitely please check that site out. Uh, and we'll also have news up there as well. So this actually wasn't on March 28th. This was about an hour ago when I put that up uh, with just all the new info on the, the new release, as well as the, uh, the latest webinar that uh, was hosted by uh, Patch My PC. So, uh, right, skipping along, uh, where was I? So um, just if, if no one's ever seen uh, PSADG before, I guess we'll just step through like a very basic demo. And the first, uh, the first thing to do is like look at a zero config uh, demo. So this is, you don't even need to make any changes to the script. You get your downloaded, uh, sorry, these, these should not be there. Let me get rid of this. This is what our standard uh, downloaded zip file, once you extract it, you'll see this structure. Uh, you've got like a deploy application executable, which is just a, uh, essentially a launcher for the PowerShell script. Uh, you'll have your um, app deploy toolkit folder, which is contains all the logic and it contains the PowerShell uh, framework itself. 
You've got a files folder, which is where you put your MSI, your set of executable, and then support files is where you'll drop anything else that you might need for your, uh, for your deployment. For this script, we don't need to do anything. All I've done is just dropped one uh, specific MSI into this folder. And based on that, I can go ahead and I can start this deployment. I'll, I'll use the deploy application script or executable to do this. So I'll just go run as administrator. And I actually have this tool already running, so I should get a message uh, to close it down first in a second. My machine's a little slow, but it will work. There we go. All right, so this is a, the standard message that we'll get. Um, so we've got an executable that's already open and it's asking us to close it down. We've got three deferrals on this, so we can choose to close down this application or we can defer the install until later on. If you've pushed this out through, say, SCCM or Intune, what's gonna happen is someone will get a message up on screen like this. Uh, if they click defer, um, it'll wait for a, a certain period of time configured through uh, SCCM or through Intune. Actually, Intune uh, is a little bit trickier. It's, <laughs> uh, it's It kind of pops up randomly. Uh, but for SCCM, it's over, I think, every four hours. Uh, they'll get a prompt back up um, and they can just defer and they'll get a couple more deferrals based on that. This could, this is set to a number of deferrals, but we could set this as a date. So it could be deferred up until X date. Um, and that allows people to, you know, maybe you've got a, uh, an upgrade that has to be performed before a certain date. You can allow people to push it off until then. But for this instance, we'll close down the program. And you'll see there on the taskbar, uh, master package just disappeared. Uh, it's already installed, so it's not going to actually install anything, but it popped up and just said quickly uh, install in progress. And we should get a balloon, balloon tip message there in a sec, just saying uh, installation complete. We might not, um, just because of the nature of this one at the moment. But um, while we're on the topic, I just want to pop open and show you Master Wrapper. This is a tool from uh, the guys at Master Packager, and it's basically if you've uh, if you don't know how to write PowerShell, um, this will actually do a hell of a lot of the work for you. So you can just click here and go. Uh, we'll say new uh, deployment. It goes and it pulls all of the uh, PSADT uh, files. We can say load an MSI, and we'll jump back here to grab our access merge. And you'll see here it's gone and populated the version numbers. It populated all of the details related to this. I can change the branding if I want. If I jump into each of the sections, I can add new things into the install section or to uninstall or, or uh, the repair. I can uh, set up what the uh, what the installation is going to look like. So, for instance, uh, I have uh, the ability to uh, add the executables to this, uh, add new executables to the uh, running process config. You'll see it's already populated merge in here. Um, I can also do things like set up block execution. So, if someone, uh, if we want to prevent someone from installing an app. Uh, or running an application while we're doing an install, which is really useful for Office. Um, if you want to close down Word, Excel, PowerPoint, do your Office upgrade and stop people from actually trying to open those during the upgrade. Um, that's very useful for doing that. Uh, you can allow deferrals um, and yeah, set up uh, your uh, any sort of post or pre-execution actions. This is a, a kind of like a, a, a demo version, or sorry, a, a freeware version, but they do have a pro feature for their master packager suite. Uh, and then you could go in and just edit directly in here. Um, but they they have like a ton of stuff already built in here. And if I just click on save on this, I could just jump over into my master packager folder and you'll see it's gone and populated a uh, deploy application script for me. And within here, uh, it's gone and populated the, uh, the Arax merge section or the, the uh, application details. And it's put in into the relevant pre-install section uh, the show installation welcome with close apps uh, and uh, close apps countdown. This is basically just built a lot, a lot of the, the legwork that I that I might have had to do by hand. Um, it's just done. Um, so uh, this is kind of like it's a step beyond the zero config um, uh, zero config mechanism that we already have. And this allows you to do a lot more customization. So it's a really really cool tool that they've come up with. Um, so. Uh, in terms of, I just wanted to jump back actually. I, so I did that install of Master Packager. I said that it, it gives us a lot of benefits right out the gate. I mean, we got a, a deferral prompt, but if I jump into the Windows folder, into the logs and software, you'll see I have a, a Master Packager uh, log file. And this is basically the, uh, this is, sorry, I'm not, I don't have CM Trace running here. Give me one sec. Toolkit, uh, tools, CM Trace. So if I jump back and open this again, so we have like a CM trace formatted logs, uh, and that's 
we didn't have to do anything for that. We literally just dropped an MSI into a folder. We ran the deployment. We got our dialogues for free. We got the ability to close down the process for free. We get the logging all for free and we've done nothing. There's no configuration required whatsoever. And you can see all of the things that it's actually gone through here. So it's, um, uh, for instance, we detect that PowerPoint uh, was running, but it didn't have a window title that belonged to PowerPoint. So it knew that I wasn't in a slideshow and it allowed the installation to kind of proceed. Um, if, it, if I was in a slideshow, it would have prevented uh, pre pre prevented itself from running. And that's something that, you know, would have prevent, would have been useful. Um, we didn't want to interrupt an, an end user actually uh, perform or with an install while they were actually uh, uh, presenting on screen. All right. Yep. No, it will. It will just basically silently uh, 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 close out. It won't. It legs it gracefully. Uh, so it returns back an exit code to um, SCCM that just says retry later. Uh, so it'll retry after like four hours. Uh, but it it doesn't interrupt the PowerPoint. And uh, my good friend down here, Kevin, uh, has been working on some code to uh, get that same thing working in Teams. So we'll be probably adding that in very very soon. So if you're in a if you're presenting in a Teams meeting. Or um, we can also do some additional checks with the. I'm, I'm looking into this, but with the Teams API, we can probably check to see if you're on camera or if you've got if you're speaking, anything like that, and own, and take action based on when one of those things. So if you're presenting, yeah, we definitely don't want to interrupt. Um, maybe if you're uh, if you're if you're in a meeting, however, we can probably update certain types of applications, but we don't necessarily want to ruin Teams on you or ruin your experience. So. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of things that we can we can add on to a, a common kind of like install. This, this is basically stuff that just SCCM and Intune don't have right now at all. So um, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, so where was I going next? Uh, so jumping back to our installs, um, I actually covered more than I thought I would there. <laughs> uh, I was going to jump into just you know, the other types of installs, like let's say a non-MSI, what that looks like in script. So VLC, for instance, uh, what your what the, the script layout is essentially, we have our uh, our variable dec declaration start where we populate the the uh, vendor name, the, uh, the product name, version, architecture, things like that. And then we have, we come down to our install section. So we have pre-install, um, install, and then post-install. And then for our uninstall, we have the same thing again, pre-uninstall, uh, uninstall and post uninstall and the same for repair so we can drive those three different types of installs or uh, uh, deployment actions um, with the one kind of uh, deployment package and we can define how they operate here so like for instance here we'll you know run the vlc install with the following parameters which is essentially saying you know run it silently we also want to remove the shortcut off the desktop and then using that new copy files to user profiles um, function we might want to populate the details, or sorry, the um, the configuration for VLC, so the settings, um, into each user profile. So uh, by default, it, it installs a kind of a current user app, uh, and you, the settings are basically it'll pop up with a, a I think it comes up with a, a first uh, dialog, and then you have to like click a, a checkbox to, to make sure that doesn't come up any uh, anymore. We can kind of like preset that, and then uh, essentially copy that over to each user profile. So anyone new who logs in won't have those, uh, the, won't hit that same prompt. And uh, for uninstall, we essentially want to just close down, make sure that uh, VLC is closed. And then we'll run the uninstall process, which is just the same. It's a uninstall.exe and forward slash s. Uh, and essentially, yeah, that just makes uh, makes life nice and easy. Uh, we can do the whole lot from, from one uh, installation. Uh, and then in terms of a repair, uh, we can set up again, we'll do an uninstall beforehand, uh, we'll run the install a second time, remove the, the shortcut, and then copy files into folks. So um, that kind of covers an awful lot of what I wanted to show in terms of demos, because I know a lot of this stuff isn't new to anyone. Um, I guess people are more interested in what is new, or what is... What's what, in V4? What's, <laughs> I knew I was going to get that. All right. So... Um, so are you doing with Directors 4, or are you going to go to 11? So we have we have 
essentially put V3 into maintenance mode. Um, we don't want to do any more updates to it, which is also not true because we're going to be doing another update for 3.10.1, I think. We're looking to probably release that in the next week or two. And that's just because we added a whole bunch of new features and invariably we added a few bugs. So uh, we want to get those kind of covered off. V4, however, is kind of a bigger deal. Um, and it's been it's been something that we've had um, in the works for quite some time. I'm looking for my, where did I do my slide deck? Which one is it? Ah, this one. So, come on. So effectively, is it screen? Nope, there we go. All right, so V4. Um, we're completely gutting the code base. Um, we're also going to be supporting uh, PowerShell 5.1 and PowerShell 7.4 uh, is a, the plan. We're going to have a minimum requirement of .NET 8 um, plus the latest support of Microsoft OS, which currently is Windows 10 uh, 22H2 and Server 2016. Uh, the reason that we're doing that is effectively there's a whole bunch of security reasons we want to do it. There's also, we need to drop old uh, supported OS versions. We've been supporting XP for the longest time. We've supported PowerShell V2. Oh my God, will they go away? There, <laughs> There is so much old hacky code in there to just keep supporting those. And it's all to support like, you know, a handful of banks or um, customers who just really won't upgrade the machines. And, you know, enough is enough. We kind of have to move on from there. So. This is effectively what we've decided as our minimum baseline. And I think it sets us for, or sets us on a good path for the future. So we can remove a lot of old hacky code. Uh, we can start using new things like, sorry, when I say new things like get sim object, um, that's not new. That's like, that was in PowerShell 3, yeah. but we've not been able to use it. We've had to stick with um, get WMI object for this whole time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really good reasons for why we have to start moving forward. The other thing is, and everyone has wanted us to create a module for ages. We didn't want to. Uh, we had our reason for it. A lot of those being down to uh, supportable, supported version. So if you install a module on a machine, you have no guarantee that you're going to be able to get that version upgraded at any point in time. I, I mean, I've seen so many module upgrades fail, especially if you have a DLL in the mix. Uh, if there's a DLL baked in as part of that. And especially by the nature of PS82, people tend to, well, there is a, there is a module up in the gallery that we don't condone. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons is people then go into their profile and they immediately do import module. And that means that module cannot be upgraded. <laughs> so the second you import it into your user profile, we're kind of screwed. Um, so this has a big ramification for deployments because if you're stuck at an old uh, module version and we, you tested all your new stuff against a newer module version. What happens when half your deployments fail? Are we responsible or are you? I mean, so we don't want to get into that whole situation, um, but we do have to move to a module because it's the new hotness. Um, it's not I even love that hotness, test. But um, it's just the hotness. It's just the hotness. Uh, old hotness. The old hotness. <laughs> so, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to probably put it up on the PowerShell gallery, but we're going to ask people to keep it with the deployment. So if you're packaging an application, put it into the subfolder, we'll import it from that location. Then we don't get into the whole mess of version help. Uh, but I know there is some people who just want to use an installed module. God knows why. I really can't. I, yeah, I can't. Uh, but look, if you want to do it, then fine. I would rather us have a supported module version up there rather than something that's been hacked together as the current one is a little bit. And we found bugs in that, that, you know, we're then being asked to support and yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, module, but please keep it with the, uh, uh, with your deployment. And that allows you to have consistency between the version you test, uh, and then deploy out to your end users. Uh, so the other big thing is I know module, uh, would generally mean huge amounts of change because you're going to have to import the module as part of your deployment script. And then we're going to have to have, uh, uh, we're going to have to worry about module scope and, uh, variables being passed between them and global variables. We don't want that whole thing. So actually we're trying to work around that as best we can. Uh, we're aiming to have full backwards compatibility with V3 scripts. So you won't have to actually import the module at all. You will keep your script the same. 
when you dot source the app deploy toolkit main, we're going to actually import the module and we'll use that app deploy toolkit main, the new one, as a shim. So it'll basically do, be act as a translation layer between the existing script format and then all of our new hotness. And that will be kind of the, that's sort of the intent as of right now. Uh, we're kind of planning this out and uh, so far we haven't hit any major technical problems with that. I'm hoping we don't. Yeah. I think it actually will work. Um, and one of the big reasons for this is, uh, you know, patch my PC's investment here is we want to be able to support custom apps um, for the customers who have uh, PSADT uh, based deployments and then import them into uh, patch my PC's uh, cloud solution. Yep. In order to do that, they need to be, ha to, they need to have a supported version. And so getting, getting up to the latest versions of everything means or getting up to the latest versions of um, PowerShell 5.1 within the support of Microsoft product um, lifecycle, then that's that's kind of where we want to be. So the idea is we have no breaking changes in V4. In V5, however, we're going to break everything. Um, <laughs> but that's essentially we will be we'll be providing a lot of deprecation and a lot of um, uh, notice on that one. Uh, so the other thing I suppose obviously as well is uh, our, our big worry point was around verb noun name uh, uh, conventions. Right now, I made some bad decisions in the past. Uh, <laughs> and those bad decisions are going to live with me for a little bit longer because we're going to rename things as they should be named accordingly. However, we'll put in aliases for the old uh, naming conventions. We will hopefully not change any parameters uh, for the moment. V5, we will change all that and we will break everything. So. That buys people a little bit more time. It gets us up to a supported platform that uh, Patch My PC can support uh, customers on, and it yeah it will hopefully then get people familiar with the new uh, format essentially. So you're saying your package is the key module in your package with V4 to work because you package them already, and they start building new packages with V5. Those ones. So so essentially, if you if you choose to upgrade your V3 packages with V4. Oh, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. I'm, 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 can you phrase it again one more time? Um, basically, like if you're uh, using V4 now, or we so I'm using V4, and because you're going to keep it inside the package, when it's time to go to V5, because your net new stuff, you've got to deal with the breaking changes to your existing package that's going to install. Okay, will, so. will there be breaking changes from V4 to V5? Yeah? Ish. Ish. Okay. So, so, so for V3 to V4. So right now, your your if your package is working, you can keep using it. You don't need to. You don't technically need to upgrade it at all. If you decide you want to take advantage of some new functionality in V4, you can take a V3 script and you will be able to just replace the app deploy toolkit main folder. Your existing script should still work, and that's essentially what we're what we're saying is we're trying to make life easier. If you want to upgrade to v4, or if you're a patch from PC customer and you want to be on a supported version, you'll be able to take your existing script, throw in the new v4 stuff, uh, and nothing should really break there. Uh, everything, everything you you shouldn't need to upgrade your v3 script. It should just still work. When it comes to v5, we'll probably have to have some sort of migration tool for that. Um, that's going to migrate an existing script, or you're probably just going to rewrite, or be, or you'll probably decide, okay, well, that's all the old stuff. We're not going to bother upgrading that. It works. Why bother touching it? We'll just start building for V5 going yeah. forward. All right. Does that make sense? We have to do a giveaway. We can continue asking questions, but can you go to the browser, please? I can. Thank you. Before we do that, <laughs> I'm going to try and chance something. Okay. We have less than a minute. We don't. We have more than that. <laughs> it's but you guys will stick around, right? So, <laughs> so in case anyone, because I mean, visual. Everyone likes visuals a little bit. So V four. Oh, it's not. Damn. Hang on. <clears throat> Come on, go away. Go away. Okay, I, I cannot get rid of this damn thing. Hang on. And such it. Okay, it's there. Okay, so this is eh, good. All right, so this is kind of what we're looking at for V4, uh, the, the UI differences between the two. Conceptually, 
they look kind of quite different. They're actually not all that different at all. If you just look at them, you'll see the functionality is all entirely the same. Oh, that's a bug I hadn't worried about. I haven't figured <laughs> out yet. Um, so essentially, yeah, you you you'll you'll still have the information presented the same way, or sorry, presented in a different way, but it is actually the same information. You have like a, the ability to uh, continue or defer. You have the ability to close applications. Um, it's just presented in a nice new. Uh, don't think it's ever been done before. Uh, Windows eleven fluent uh, interface style. And more importantly, the hotness it works in dark mode. We dark love mode. it. Not only that, but I don't know if it's coming across there, but it's actually a Mika window. Um, so you can actually see the the blue effect coming through, bleeding through from the desktop. I don't know of anyone who's actually managed to pull this off so far. That's um, awesome. I got some. Uh, I've been working on this for months with uh, one of the guys from um, uh, Master Packager. Um, uh, Norris and uh, yes, thank you, Norris, for all your help with this. But yeah, so that's kind of where we're at with V4 right now in terms of look and feel. Uh, we want to have it like nice, new, fresh, and yeah, there we go. Awesome. So back to our giveaway. Yes. Go to the go to the browser window. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry. When is V4 being released? Uh, no comment. <laughs> all right. All right. Really quick giveaway, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to get in. Um, go to swagit.io, um, put in the code in the middle. We'll wait a couple of minutes and uh, then we'll see what happens. Can I win? Uh, sure. Just answer the question on V4. Uh, so we were aiming to have a pre preview release for MMS, which is in a month, which is probably a little bit ambitious. Uh, but we're, I think our, our drop dead date for that is something like June 1st. And then we're aiming to have a full release by end of September, hopefully. So that's, we're trying to commit, uh, commit to actually getting that released. And we've got a, a lot of um, people working on it. Well, five, so. Okay, we got 16 entrants, 17, Andrew. <laughs> if Andrew wins, he'll, he'll, figure out what he's going to do with that. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Uh, a couple more minutes. I know uh, this is the last session, so we could just hang out forever. Uh, so the question was, does this work with um, uh, null software, the NSIS uh, format? Yes. Uh, if it's an executable uh, that takes a um, command line parameter to run silently, or even actually we can automate that as well. So if it comes up with UI, we can just auto hotkey it like almost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anything we throw at it, you get benefits if it's an MSI or an MSIX in that you get automatic logging. And so it'll, uh, but, but I mean, if you can output the log to, uh, from uh, Ensys, then yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll be able to get, capture that as well. And works the same too. Yep. All right. Before we do the question, we're going to do a quick draw. Uh, no one's, no one you has come in for a couple of minutes. Uh, so everyone, do a drum roll. Come on, let's get some energy. All right, drum roll time. Great drum roll. Yeah, just keep it going. Keep time. Come on. Oh, it's going faster. Jasmine Swint, can you come up and? Uh, Congratulations. <laughs>